Hello, everyone. I hope you are doing great today. This is Juan Castillo, and welcome to our uh, second podcast episode of the universe. As you know, the world's first uh, NFT collection artistically customized with real DNA. The goal of this podcast is to promote education, open dialogue about decentralized science, NFTs, and, and blockchain, and educate a bit the audience about different profiles and, and about the NFT space. Our guest today is a remarkable scientist with an extraordinary curriculum and, and passionate for Web3, blockchain, and NFT technology. Uh, it's a, it is our pleasure to welcome Jason Otterstrom. Uh, Jason, welcome to the Never podcast. How are you today? Ah, I'm doing well. Thanks, Juan. How are you doing? Oh, all good, all good. Thank you. Thanks for being with us. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Jason Otterstrom. Yeah, Otterstrom. It's it, it looks scary when you first read it, but then you hear it and it makes sense. <laughs> Where did that come from? It's a, it's a Scandinavian, probably? Yeah. Originally from, I believe, Sweden, then from Norway onto the US, where my ancestors gave rise okay. to me. So I'm a mix, like everyone over on that continent. <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. Well, as I say, thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure uh, having you in, uh, in this podcast. It's the second one. So great profile. We are raising the bar every time that we are doing one. This is the second one, but more to come. So if you agree, let me first introduce you to, to the audience. Mm -hmm. so have a better idea of who you actually are. I guess you get this a lot, but honestly, I don't even know where to start with such an amazing background. So let me try and please correct me if I'm missing something or I'm saying something wrong. Sure. So you are originally from Salt Lake City, Utah in the US. You graduated summa cum laude in, in applied physics at the University of Utah, including a year mm -hmm. abroad in Spain. You graduated in the Harvard Biophysics program based out of the Harvard Medical School. You spent some time in Groningen, the Netherlands. So after the PhD, you became a Marie Curie postdoctoral researcher at the Institute of Photonic Sciences in Barcelona. Spain. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So where, this is the, the place where you're currently living and working. Yeah. Yeah. Set up roots here in uh, the suburb of Barcelona called okay. Castel de Fels. It's, it's quite nice. Okay. That's a very nice area, actually. Yeah. Nice place to live and work at the same time. Okay. Indeed. Yeah. So during the pandemic, uh, I believe in 2020, you were not wasting your time while working as an application scientist for IDEA Biomedical. You obtained <laughs> an executive MBA from the Quantic School of Business. At the same time, you started learning, playing around with blockchain technology through one of your uh, specialization courses or classes that you, you took at the MBA. And I believe this course steered things up, right? Like you started building up your yeah. portfolio, building up your interest on, on this market. And you mentioned to me that you got wrecked several times with trade, yeah. like NFTs, and uh, yeah. But you still love everything that you learned yeah, it was, in technology work. Yeah, I, uh, I took the specialization in my MBA as the, the 2021, like May Bitcoin crash was ending. So that was okay. a decent time to get a smooth entrance before I got wrecked up to the second peak. But I really loved the idea that I didn't realize before that specialization course was how the cryptocurrencies and a token model is mm -hmm. able to create trust amongst anonymous parties for on shared economic interest. And it was that connection of the transparency and this way that you can make people be trustworthy <laughs> that I yeah. found a really fascinating mix and what really dr drove me into take a full nosedive into the world of crypto. Okay, that, that's fantastic. Actually, that, that's great that you realize, okay, this is a great technology. This is a great space to be in. And, and hopefully you learn from your losses and turn around your portfolio. Your portfolio. <laughs> yeah, and most of my losses, uh, one meme coin, one meme coin that I'm unhappy about. And uh, I got into some GameFi because i an old school gamer. I love the idea of having to have NFTs as part of the game. Yeah. And I think it's a great use case for NFTs mm -hmm. that I think would bring it into the mainstream. Yeah. And so that was where it's it, making a great AAA game is not the same as developing a sustainable tokenomics model with a, a buy and pre sell pressures that a normal game doesn't have. So it's, it, it, it was new. So you're going to yeah. get wrecked if it's new, but it was you still fun. To, you have to, you have yeah. to learn the process and you, 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 you need to get some losses, hopefully not that big. So you start analyzing and seeing through more projects yeah. and how this could go for, right? Yeah, it helps to learn what's, what to look for, but also a lemma yeah. of crypto is don't put in what you're not willing to lose, so. Yeah, well, as, as I say, I, I believe you have an, an spectacular background. I'm not the, an expert in science per se, but I think you are, you are a person that is eager to learn more about technology, blockchain. Mm -hmm. and it is, so just to, to land your profile a bit, right? Like coming from yourself, tell us a bit your science journey, okay? Why, why did you choose biophysics and how did you end where you are today? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got into biophysics basically because growing up, 
I always had biology surrounding me. My parents did had their undergraduate degree in biology. So it was a common theme that we talked about. I loved playing with critters and catching animals and bugs. Okay. Then as I got to the university, I needed something a bit new and I got into physics and I had a very good physics professor at the mm -hmm. University of Utah who pulled me in and convinced me to sacrifice a summer in catching up on the math that I needed to be able to do physics. And that was a great opportunity for me. I think it opened a lot of new doors that a traditional single discipline background would not have opened. And then when I went to graduate, first I went to Spain as a year abroad, which taught me to uh, relax, which <laughs> was not part of my <laughs> myself before. And then uh, I went back and applied to graduate school and biophysics was really a, na a natural thing given the mix of biology and physics that I already had. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity at Harvard was very flexible because you could circle around a lot of different labs, take classes anywhere. So I, I, I tried systems biology, which was a lot of fun. I tried some quantum mechanics and statistical mechanics at MIT and learned that my math was simply not good enough. Mm -hmm. So I stuck to the squishier stuff and found the field of single molecule biophysics to be really mm -hmm. intriguing. So this was just after the big financial crash in 2008, when I got into it and it just coincided with technology in the camera industry that allowed the visualization of a single fluorophores with uh, a relatively fast frame rate and a relatively affordable price range for mm -hmm. science. And so okay. there was a big boom in the ability to see, to see individual fluorescent molecules labeled yeah. on different biological structures. So I was in uh, the lab of a, a nice, great Dutch name, and he's the one I went to Kroningen with. And okay. he, uh, he showed me the ropes of science and, and a lot of the, all the periphery that current comes around it. And that was really where I got, you know, started into the microscopy field that I continued then as a postdoc by using single molecule localization for super resolution microscopy, which is like the ability to see below a traditional diffraction limit. So mm -hmm. that's basically the diffraction limit is the smallest kind of separation between two objects that a normal set of, of optics like glasses or objectives would allow you to do. Yeah. And so with special tricks, it was actually a Nobel Prize in 2014, okay. the fundamental technology of, of some of the single molecule stuff and super resolution imaging. And okay. it allows you to res resolve biological structures at a much finer length scale than normal microscopy can. Because really biology is something that if you can visualize, it gives you a ton of knowledge about what's actually mm -hmm. going, what's going on at the within yeah. the biological example. There's a number of techniques, but this one is with fluorescence. And it gets down to a length scale of about 20 nanometers if you look horizontally and about 50 nanometers if you want to go in 3D. Okay. There are other methods that can do not quite as high resolution, but have other advantages. And then you have electron microscopy, which is completely different because it does not use light. Rather, yeah. it uses electrons to create an image. Okay. And the reason is because electrons have, have a much shorter wavelength. And so their diffraction limit is inherently much smaller <laughs> than, especially the visible spectrum. Okay, so, so you're, you're playing with the visualization, with the lining to highlight those parts, all those particles that you really need to observe how the structure evolves and it works and develops. So, so you can get yeah, what's behind, right? Exactly, exactly. And with electron microscopy, you, they get amazing images down to the angstrom levels, but mm, there's not, it's very challenging to get contrast and specific labeling to say, okay, I see a dark blob and a light blob. And I know the dark blob is protein A and the dark blob, the light blob is pro protein B. Yeah. It's not so good at that. But what fluorescence is really good at is saying there's light at this point and not light at this point. So you know that whatever you tag the light, the, the fluorescent particle to is mm -hmm. what you're looking at. So these particles that you don't want to observe, right? Sort of. uh, you're giving high contrast, high contrast, high contrast and specificity is the word. That's a word that when you say it in a presentation, you have to pr practice a lot because specificity yeah. is not <laughs> a specifically easy word to pronounce in public. But yeah, it's uh, that's where it comes in is when you see something, you have a yeah. very high reliability that what you think you're looking at is what you're looking at okay. if you've done your controls right. Okay, so I believe this is one of your, uh, I would say, tasks or, or responsibilities working at the idea, uh, biomedical. I yeah. Believe. It's something related mm -hmm. to the 
still run. So tell us more about your, your current job. Uh, what are you doing right now and how your company, how yourself, you're adding value to the scientific community? What, what are you putting out there with, uh, with this technology? Yeah, so I, I have been working with IdeaBio for about four years now, a little over okay. four years. And they are a very small startup sized company, even though they've been around for a while doing high content imaging. I got to know the company during my postdoc doing super resolution imaging. And this was moving into a very different world for me because high content imaging is the way that a lot of pharmaceutical companies do drug screening. Of course, okay. they're looking for active compounds and they want to say, okay, the cells that we've treated either are dying and we want them to die or they are missing some function. Okay. And when we put this compound on it, that function becomes, starts working again. So it's called All the right. recovery of function. Well, that's pretty and, nice. Yeah. And so these guys, depending on, you know, how many screen, how many compounds are yeah. in their library, there can be tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands. And so they need these whole microscopy process automated from image acquisition and image analysis. And so for me to come from single molecule biophysics, which mm -hmm. a lot about the imaging and analysis, but it's all manual and hands-on to something okay. fully automated was really fun. And so we are, since we're small competing against giants, we have to be in our service offering. So what we offer is like a more artisan approach. So we really work closely with, with our clients to develop new hardware and also software based on, on their needs. So right now, one of the exciting things that we're working on is actually with zebrafish. So for me to go from imaging things on the scale of 20 nanometers, being, wow, the zebrafish is really amazing because it's several millimeters long. It's a huge scale upwards in size, mm -hmm. even though zebrafish are, are nearly impossible to see with your naked eye if you're not looking at them. Yeah, that, 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 that's fascinating, actually, that you are transforming this sort of observation with it through the microscope and then you artistically represent, right? That is for, for clients mm -hmm. who are hiring you. That's something that, that it really relates to us because as the universe, it's uh, it's uh, doing something similar. The protein data bank to, to, to recreate 100% scientifically accurate all these proteins and this is part of the, the NFT collection that we are that we're putting out there right so so it's we, we I see some sort of similarities between what you are doing and what we are doing I mean I think it, the, the parallel I think is that you, the NFT field is still really nascent yeah. and it's based on art and 3D for science I've seen you guys work is really good at bringing science to art and so it's uh, the NFT is art in itself but making a value out of that and a proper use case that's the new that's the new niche that you're trying to go into. And I think it's a good timing, good timing for that. Good and that's with our technology with Zebrafish, we're trying to use AI to help people analyze it easier. So it's a very niche field. Zebrafish right researchers actually have a big challenge getting funded for their research because you say, oh, I'm going to look at this really horrible renal disease or heart disease or neural, this heart disease look, looking at zebrafish. And you're like, but if we want to see it in humans. What does a fish have to do with it? Like you know, really and they have this whole process. It's actually relevant and it's really fast. And there's incredibly in Barcelona, a really amazing startup that works on toxicology screening with zebrafish okay. because yeah, it's a very fascinating field. So mm -hmm. it's exciting. Well, it's also, yeah, and uh, it's, it's your feel, your feel it's, it's fascinating. I think uh, everybody, I think I heard about physics, uh, about biophysics. I think it's more of a hidden player around. And I believe it is the core of everything, right? This is a, who we are, what are we made of? So for those that are not really familiar with your field, what have been the, maybe the major contributions of the biophysics uh, to, to modern biology? And uh, maybe also what are the, the, the biggest unsolved problems or, or main challenges in applied biophysics? Yeah, biophysics is basically taking uh, the, the principles of physics in terms of trying to build everything from the bottom up. So for instance, statistical mechanics, you start with one particle in a vacuum. Then you say, now there are two particles. What happens? Mm -hmm. Now we're adding more particles. Now it's not a vacuum. It's a, you know, closed, it's like a compressed system interacting with another. Wow. So building it up from the bottom. And so it's been quite influential in, in protein folding. So figuring out, or at least attempting to figure out no. If we have this linear sequence of peptides, mm -hmm. how does that fold into something not only regular, but functional and in a reliable fashion, a reliable enough fashion for life to exist, even though the underlying actions causing it to fold are randomized Brownian motion. So this is a kind of question for 
biophysics. And then they've also looked at lipid mixing. So our cells are made of, of lipids of different types. Uh, there's been a lot of work in that. I think the thing I found most fascinating was motor proteins. This was uh, one of the early applications of the field, the aspect of biophysics I'm biased towards in that single molecule, because there was arguments of how does a motor protein, like the, the myosin proteins that are in our muscle, allow for movement, right? We rely on these tiny proteins to basically grab on and pull and grab on and pull in a, a directional fashion, even though the world around them is not directional. And that's how we all muscles move. That's how transport wow. occurs in the body. And so by tagging individual proteins with fluorescent molecules and watching them, they see how big is the step size? How does the step size couple to energy transformations? So energy in the body is in the form of adenosine triphosphate, ADP, mm -hmm. ATP. And how does actually breaking this chemical bond release the energy and allow the thermodynamics to work? What the, moving yeah. the proteins in a specific way. It's all based on probability, but that the probability is shifted in a directional and reasonably reproducible well, fashion. Can, can better mean, than though? technical trading. Better better than technical trading in crypto. Let's yeah. give you let's give it that because their that fifty percent <laughs> fifty percent win rate there is really good. And biology is better than that. So so <laughs> we're, we're talking about probabilities or more like a randomized maybe game of theory or something. Like that. Oh, oh, really it's probability. When you're dealing with proteins, it's probabilities. So you look at the current state of a protein and then based on whether the conformation will change or not, that gives rise to a rate. And these rates are basically the probability of any one protein doing that. Okay. And so the, it's really these probabilities that work together to create a system mm -hmm. that is reliable, even though the underlying elements are probabilistic in nature. Okay. And, and that's, so that's really like the biophysics that I found really fascinating. It, 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 is, it is fascinating. It is, it is, it is, it is something that you, maybe you don't imagine, right? And, and it, one of the questions that you were talking about when you say a protein moving with, with this, when you highlight them with, with this fluorescent, um, did you see them live with the microscopes or it's more like a simulation? How, how do you see this? So they were what's called in vitro system. So they take the bio, uh, uh, a, a bunch of cells and they grind them up and they yeah. extract the proteins of interest. That was how they had to do it back then. Now we have a myriad amount of, of genetic engineering techniques that yeah. makes s extracting some proteins easier, depending on which one, but they would just grind it up and extract it. And so they would take the filament, for instance, mm -hmm. myosin, runs along a, a filament called actin that helps give, it's a fundamental fiber for the cytoskeleton that gives a cell a shape, right? Mm -hmm. uh, an internal cytoskeleton. But this cytoskeleton is also a runway for a highway for transport. Uh, so there's a lot of different kinds of myosin. The myosin that we're most familiar with is like in muscle, but there's other ones that are supposed to specifically for transport along actin filaments. And so they would put the actin filament down on glass, take the purified protein, label it in a specific fashion so that the label went to a known location, which was no easy challenge. Yeah. Uh, and then watch as it would take eight nanometer steps. Boom. And then the question was, how is it doing it? Is it doing it like an inchworm, like eight nanometer mm -hmm. time or a 16, two arms that are doing a 16 nanometer step. And actually th there was a time that was a huge, huge like fight, like literal like bar brawl, fist fight, like mentality of, of two, two sides until that somebody watched it happening and said, look, it's happening. And like the video showed it off, you know, yeah. Yeah, they thought it's probably still on YouTube somewhere. Yeah. There must be always controversy, right? About these things that so somebody has another theory, so another one has another theory. And then uh, they, I think there will be fights and a struggle between each other until somebody say, look, guys, uh, Nobel Prize, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I will tell you how it does, right? <laughs> it's all right? I got the video. I got the video. Wait, wait. I don't wait. need anything else. Together, let's Put it on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that was uh, that was in in the field of single molecule biophysics when I went into it. That was the new stuff, and it was what I found really appealing is the mix of all these kind of bottom up approach with video data from biological samples yeah. that you could scale up to how how a cell works, how the, and then cells 
to, to, to higher complexity systems. Yeah, great. That's fantastic. And as you know, our, our NFT collection, the, the Genesis, the Genesis collection of our NFTs are, are the, the, the proteins. Also we call it the crypto proteins. We believe it's just the ancestor or the replicators of the, of the, of the DNA codes. And, and as you are saying, this sub level of, of, of action that is happening, we, we have no who chicken or egg, right? Who is selling who? What to, how to work, who is going first, who is giving commands or who is listening, actually. RNA. R RNA controls it all. Controls it all. All right. So that no, I'm I'm not, that's a joke. I'm not endorsing any specific form of early world theory. DNA okay. first, RNA first, other first. There's no, I'm not well versed enough to make a solid argument one way or another. But okay. I know that there are, some people think RNA came first. Because an interesting thing, you could actually have RNA, what are called RNA aptamers. RNA will also fold into reproducible 3D structures that has enzymatic activity, just like proteins. And one of my friends who studied them, he said, RNA can do anything a protein can do, just slower. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah. That's your friend who said that, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, yeah, he was uh, very tenacious. He did very difficult experience on RNA aptamers. A lot of respect. Okay. All right. Okay. Now that you mentioned the 3D, in our project, we had the scientists just designing the proteins. As I say, we went to the protein data bank, we used the data, I mean, it was a lot of work behind. So we now show these 200 crypto proteins that, that we believe are going to be the ancestors of the replications, DNA replication in the metaverse. So as I said, we did this manual. We, it took us a lot of time and to and research and, and, and work behind. How do you evaluate the leap of, of new deep learning algorithms like, like AlphaFold? in predicting this protein structure and how you, your company, Idea Bio, participated in, in this challenge. Do you have any implication on involvement? How do you see this, this field? Yeah, so the AlphaFold project with, has provided a huge leap forward in the applicability of, of deep learning by overcoming the, the Leventhal paradox. So if your listeners are not familiar with that, it's basically how, if you have a protein that's 20, 20 amino acids, what are all the possible configurations that it can have? And if it does some estimated rate for probing all of them, how long will it take for the protein to fold? And it comes out some several orders of magnitude larger than the lifetime of the universe. So it's like, how does this actually happen? And so that was, that's the foundation of the foundation of, of the difficulty involved with protein folding. And they had been a lot of physics trying to figure out how to fold it. And alpha fold is really amazing because they just fed it input output and it was actually able to make accurate predictions which is shocking which is great uh, i think right yeah i think that it will very it, it it can reduce the cost for first level in silico drug screenings i think uh, that's probably the the first big area just you don't need to take a, actual proteins or live cells just run it through a computer this is all also you can't forget that alpha that deep mind that controls alpha fold is controlled by alphabet google so it's entirely the opposite spectrum of what we're talking about with nfts dna verse they yeah. control all of the access to anybody who wants it yeah and so basically it's, it's pretty centralized right it's That's entirely it's one it's not centralized it's one it's only right? one exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. it's only one and a lot it was oh i remember when google first came out their logo was do no evil but they abandoned that. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a good move. It was a profitable move on their part. That's for sure. Yeah. But yeah, they're the ones who control that. So I'm not, I don't know enough about protein folding in the modern day and to know how influential or if something similar to alpha fold, alpha fold could be re generated in, in a more public domain as it is, as it is right now, it's very centralized. And mm -hmm. so as powerful as it, there's one gatekeeper. So that's like one crypto whale. You think that the Dogecoin whale has power over Dogecoin, man. Yeah, I, I, they have, they, these guys control everything about AlphaFold. Yeah, absolutely. This, this is the, the, I would say, what you say is a whistleblower, right? It's like, a, yeah, I, I think science or, or research in science is notorious for, for the gatekeeping. And, and I think that this is, I would say this has been has been the way it has been done so far. But now with, with the decentralized, decentralized autonomous organization with DAOs in, in decentralized science, we are seeing this, this move is kind of getting more democratized, right? We are opening the, the space to people that actually want to go in one direction. They don't need to wait for an institution to, to see the potential behind, right? They, they just, they're gonna get rewarded for the study because the, the community decide, okay, this is important for 
us. We want to know what is behind, and this person actually is the right person to do it. So let's vote. Let's put up to vote, and if, if it goes well, let's fund it. And this is uh, it's something that I wanted to ask you as well before you mentioned AlphaFold uh, being fully centralized, which is, I would say monopolized. Uh, so how, how can science can be more decentralized? Yeah, I, I think that science has been trying to decentralize itself. It's challenging because there's a lot of stakeholders and in, in, in money involved. Mm. Uh, but it's the D side actually is something new that I'm still learning about. I'm not super familiar with it. So I have a lot to read. Mm. I found an interesting yeah. article that I skimmed through and see that there's a lot of projects touching on all aspects of science, but like funding, publishing, which is crowdsourcing idea. I think also this do-it-yourself science, the DIY mm. science, that's all a move towards decentralization. But it also, we can't lose sight of the importance of peer review and having reliable feedback given to what's accepted into the scientific sphere of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because if anybody can publish, that's a problem. If anybody can gain access for their own experiments, that's also a problem. And there's a lot of ethical concerns in terms of will they actually do what they say? Will they make up their data? Yeah. Are they actually treating all of the things in their study ethically, which is very important. Yeah. And that those <laughs> these are those are the real world things that a computer can't solve. So there's a lot yeah. of challenges. But I think that I know that from my experience as a scientist, peer review was very challenging. When you work years to get an article and you send it out, it comes back not just full of red ink, but like more experiments to do, and you don't really understand why am I doing these experiments. I think that some kind of it's important for it to be anonymous. Yeah, the peer review has to be anonymous, but I think that it's interesting with within the, the crypto space, this pseudo anonymity, right? So, you know, that's their wallet. You don't know who they are, but that's their wallet. I think that that, that kind of avatar based peer review could be very helpful. There are some uh, journals like eLife that are trying to make the peer review process more transparent. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And I think that, you know, like in a lot of in some of their articles, you, you as a reader can actually go back and see some of the peer review aspects. Yeah, uh, I think that's important because especially when in the pandemic, we've seen how the scientific method brought to the brought to society only leads to confusion because nobody wants to listen to the news and hear a maybe, whereas yeah. science exists in the answer. Maybe <laughs> I, I really like the idea of the NFT incentivization as well. If at the end of the road, if you publish an article, it gets cited and you feel good. But having an incentive would also be would also be good. But it needs to be tied to the utility of the article to avoid this kind of, you know, junk publications. The move to make open access journals is great because it removes the pay barrier to allow anyone to read the output of publicly yeah. funded science. And I completely agree with that. I've done my part. I've really pushed to try to keep my journals open access, but I didn't, it's expensive and I didn't always have the purse strings. The other side of that is that there's these predatory journals and they're not real. They're not, there's no peer review. Mm -hmm. They're just complete junk and they're just a money-making machine. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's the wild west. There was a computer scientist who actually just generated an entire article that the entire article had one phrase, take me off your mailing list. I don't know if you want to use expletives, but he included the expletive in his phrase and included, included it in graphics in the, in, in the text and the predatory journal took his article that had one phrase repeated over and over, take me off your mailing list and publish you. And, and that's so, it, right? Uh, as you said, yeah. peer review, review should, should be always present. And this is uh, what I think, in my opinion, one of the challenges of the DAOs, right? At, at the end of the day, the industry will need to get regulated right? somehow. Yeah. Or it will be the wild west. It's a, there right. is some, some sort of ethical moves, decision taken that should be reviewed somehow, and maybe some control, uh, even, even the, the world the word control in decentralized, it doesn't maybe match so well, but I think the, the contribution that, as you say, should be rewarded uh, and mm -hmm. publication is expensive and it takes time. Uh, once you do it, why not receive some tokens, right? And maybe your your contribution can be an NFT, a smart contract. There will be only one, mm -hmm. nobody can copy that. And, they, and this is something that we have seen with patent, yeah. with the insurance policies, we're seeing with the records, the real estate, we're seeing in every film at some point. Mm -hmm. This is going to get disrupted, if not getting disrupted already. But as I say, let's see. It's exciting to see where this is going yeah. to be going. It's exciting. The... Yeah. And I, I, I'm inspired by things like the, the Brave browser with their basic attention token that you yeah. can like tip. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. that. That could be really interesting. But 
it's challenging for the DAOs as well, because how do you assign votes? Is it basically on how many tokens you hold? And if so, is that really the, the best way? I was listening to a podcast of Vitalik Buterin talking about how to scale the voting to be productive, not just based on your tokens. Correct, correct. That guy, that guy like blew my mind and I couldn't understand 60% of what he said, but <laughs> he has ideas for how to do it for the, and I'm sure there's lots of other people that have ideas, but it's, it yeah. can't be just based on, on, I have the most tokens, so I get to say what happens. Because then that's the opposite of decentralization. Exactly. There is an exciting, I would say, room for improvement here. And I believe everything will be for the better. But let's see. Let's see where we go. Yeah, we are we're still in diapers, right? I think we're, we're still crawling. And before before we walk, we need to learn how to crawl and to stand up. And then and then land on our feet properly. And then we start walking a bit more. So let's see. Let's see 20, 2021 was like, mama, papa, like the first words. Exactly. <laughs> and now and we are, this takes me, uh, take me to another question now. Do you think the the decentralized science we take in any community uh or we the universe we our whole map has a DAO down the line as maybe you're not familiar entirely with our project the initial collection is 3200 nfts which are centralized mm -hmm. this is the initiation of, of the of the bio metaverse as we call it and after that we are starting the replication process which is a, as we know the collections are breathing so the, the user can start breathing or replicating the DNAs in a decentralized way. So the first holder or collectors, they will start getting a, a passive income. Once you get there decentralized, we are implementing a DAO. So the community can decide, can allocate funds, percentage of royalties. What do we do with this? We can also use it for, for example, funding some, some projects in, in your company. As I say, DAO will decide. If we take this project and another project similar or not similar in, or in, in, in decentralized science, do you think that these projects should be working together or should be working like a unified movement or, or work independently as competitors? How do you see this sort of collaboration in, in the space? So I think it's, you got to have competition. That's, and, and it's the wild west. So it's every, everything goes, but I think that because it's still the early days, there's more good players than bad actors. And I think the economic models of trying to create something the DNA verse is trying to do based mm -hmm. on the early sets and then have this kind of generation of the DNA pass that has yeah. a limited supply, but is still generated. You know, these are, these economic models are challenging and, and new with, you don't know what to expect in terms of buy and sell pressure, because on the one hand, one thing I think is interesting is an NFT that actually has your DNA on it. Are you going to, are you going to be more possessive of it? Or mm -hmm. are you going to be equally speculative as to mm -hmm. afford eight? Is, I think some people would be equally speculative, but I'm not sure about the proportion, especially the proportion of people who are inclined to find a project like DNAverse. But I think that they have to go, and my, my, my thought would be initially there, they have to be collegial competition, testing different models, finding out what works like game five, mm -hmm. uh, everything sucked. And then Axie Infinity exploded. So a lot of people tried to copy it and it's not clear why that it worked for Axie Infinity. But they had this slow growth phase that the game fight didn't have. I think competition is healthy. It will raise the bar. It will mm -hmm. it will keep you on your I think you say on your toes, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're trying to improve what you're doing. And then we're talking about Web3. Web3 is about collaboration and giving value to the community. To be fair. Okay, you're not mm -hmm. you're not asking, but you're asking and giving. You are requesting and providing. It's a bi-directional message uh, and if you are having competition doing something similar you'll be okay guys we need to rethink what we're doing we need to start giving more value we need to the content has to be has to have more uh, uh, quality or, or, or whatever and, and this is something healthy i have always been in every industry so mm -hmm. uh, i think there's a healthy underpinning of transparency that under the, that's at the foundation everybody has to put their stuff on github like when has that happened before yeah <laughs> Exactly. Like, one of the tests, is there code on GitHub? If their code's not on GitHub, it's not yeah. good. Yeah, exactly. Period. So, you know, you have to have your industry secrets somewhere else. Look at the competition between blockchains. Now, like at first it was Bitcoin and then Bitcoin and Ethereum. And then Litecoin was in there as well. It didn't make a big stir. And then, boom. I thought that, you know, and now they're competing and now they're competing heavily, right? Which one is, is going to win? Probably none because they each have their own better, better use cases. So yeah. that's what we'll eventually find out. I was in fact, just listening this morning to a podcast that was saying that if you talk to the people who invented the internet about having this video conference that we're having right now, they'd have yeah. told you you're crazy. 
that you should stick to the cape to the phone lines because it's more reliable and the bandwidth yeah. is better but here we are here we are exactly uh, <laughs> this, this is something that we are doing at the universe right we are seeing the future and the 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 earlier you get into the project the the more benefits or, or the earlier benefits you will receive. And you can mm -hmm. always sell it. Uh, and, and the way we do it is, okay, you have an early genotype and then you can replace the DNA. You don't want it anymore. You want to sell it. Okay, let's bring somebody in, in the replication process and then let's exchange the DNA sample and then we recreate a new one. But this person will hold this one. We hold this genotype zero or one with a new mm -hmm. DNA. And the other person is just out, right? So there, there is a logical evolution and everything else. And, and we see the universe as the, the replication of life this is that's why we believe the decentralization has to kick in so the life can explode and, and go through mm -hmm. different ways and then the DAO will control this this is how, how we see it um we are in the future we are like, we live in metaverse mm -hmm. right? and, and, and the universe mission or vision is, is sort of like you're talking about ai in the future and in, if you're talking about metaverses how do we distinguish each other how do we know okay this person is a bot or this avatar is a bot or is a mm -hmm. human behind? How do I do this? And this is one of the one of the missions we have, which is humanize more the metaverse and, and think, okay, we're not talking about identifying who is behind, but it's what is behind. It sounds a bit like science fiction, but I believe we are going in this direction. I'm bringing yeah. the genetics into this NFT world and, and, and changing how we, we see the metaverse, as we call it, the bio metaverse and bio avatar. Not only your mm -hmm. avatar, you can also have another NFT that you want to use as a PFP and we geneticize with your DNA, that NFT, multi cross chain. There, there is a ton of possibilities, and this is on our white paper, so everybody can go to the universe mm -hmm. of and read about this. So let's jump up in into the metaverse because I believe you are also a fan of NFTs and, and metaverse and how this technology is changing the way we see things. And how do you think the universe, as I explained, is changing the metaverse as we see today and bringing this genetics in, in, in a decentralized mm -hmm. way in digital worlds? How do you think this is going to uh, unveil? In front of us the metaverse is still so meta e that <laughs> you know <laughs> it's it, it, you know it's still forming obviously people like the social interactions and being able to verify who you are as you alluded to will be interesting how do you, how, is it a bot is it because they can already do deep fakes right so a bot yeah. is not far off from being a, a human know. fake and and in the metaverse people want to have social interactions but some people are fine having interacting with a bot and not caring other yeah. people will want to know this is actually a human so having bringing in the real world human element yeah. into the matrix if it hadn't been for the matrix movie we definitely would call it the matrix and not the metaverse i think <laughs> absolutely do you see yourself putting your vr goggles and going to see a movie not yet but not we are yet. doing that already right yeah or, or the shop to your house and then what are, probably you're gonna even go to the virtual shop and and, and i heard this comment a lot okay I'm not going to do that. I'm going to still do it using internet. What about internet is not there anymore? Or what about if Amazon say we stop our services on the internet and we only do metaverse? Or this product is going to be only available in the metaverse. Would you do it? Uh, I was just saying it depends on how how uh, quick people are to jump in. You have the early adopters, then mainstream adoption, and then you have the last stragglers who will not do it. So it'll uh, it's going to be a while, but the metaverse is going to be I mean, it's interesting. I hadn't thought about going to Amazon and actually shopping in like a virtual reality sense that would yeah. be uh it, it, interesting. It, it, it sounds a bit uh, interesting i just think that the, the humanization with dna it's interesting but there's ethical there's a lot of ethics because what happens if it gets stolen ultimately does that mean anything if it becomes part of your identity how much of your real world value assets identity is tied to to something like an asset like that yeah absolutely and this is one of the questions that we also would like to answer to the community that they're asking now, okay, what about the data uh, or the, meta, the metadata behind? One of the things that we are not doing, we are not in the business of DNA sample kits, right? Our, our, we are working, we're partnering now, sorry, with some laboratory that are taking care of that. They manage the data, they host it, they, they just keep it there. They destroy the sample. We are not touching the data. Why is the, the motivation behind this? Because what we want to give you is an NFT that it looks like you, but it's not you. You are, you are not going to have a metadata, in, a metadata, sorry, in the smart contract behind. This is not our goal. Our goal is to transform this visually and customize it for you. Obviously, we are giving the option to the community in the future to say, okay, I want actually my data in this in this blockchain on this smart contract because I want to have it there. 
but the the goal is to start giving a visualization of your mm-hmm. genetic which is maybe it, it's like a mind blowing to 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 link the two ideas but uh, and uh, you go to the website you see some examples of how we do i want to give you your dna this is your dna with your genetics but you will see them you won't have to read them on code or something and obviously the ethics behind and security is something that it really concerns us that's why we we highlight okay this is not not your customer or biometric identification this is human identification you're a human you know ai that's it this is you hmm. right okay that's interesting it's interesting i'm actually really interested to see which are the 200 proteins that that yeah. you've decided to to select and, and put in, into the initial drop that's exciting yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, I don't know if I mentioned to you, but the, the 200 proteins that we are that we are creating are different. Each of them has a different rarity and trace. So the, the ranking is one to 200. Each of them has a different as the proteins in life that are essential to life. This one has a different name, different function, different rarity, which are going to in the DNA replication down the line. It's, it's, it's really exciting. And, and I believe our audience would be really interested to know more about this. So I, I think it's, the project is going to be a, a game changer. I think our Discord community is going to be more active lately with, with the high profile scientific, maybe like yours. I believe you are already there. As I should say, we just want to bring up some dialogue, some value to the both NFT and scientific community. So I think the the combination collaboration between both it is fantastic. And I know this conversation it's uh, it's getting long extended and we it could last even hours. But but I believe mm-hmm. we we leave it here. Jason, this has been of extreme value. Thanks again for being with us. Absolutely. So I don't know if you really want to leave your social media uh, handles or something. We will just put them around there. Maybe on LinkedIn or maybe uh, Twitter whatever you like. Uh, yeah, I think LinkedIn is is probably the best way if you want to actually find me. I am in the, the DNAverse Discord and, and a few other places. So if you can figure out what my handle name is, kudos yeah. to you. Thanks for being with us. It has been really insightful. I've been uh, honestly learning a lot from you and, and I hope to see you soon, hopefully for the second time. And, and we just yeah. maybe the Excellent. Yeah, I mean, for your new project. Indeed, indeed. And but yeah, if in the future you want uh, to come back and talk again once we've had some drops, That'd be great. Absolutely. Again, Jason, thanks again. Let's uh, let's cut it here for everybody. Uh, we are Universe. Visit us on the website, Dniverse.io. Follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn. You will have them somewhere around. And we are happy to have you in the community. Uh, we are doing something really big, really pretty exciting. And uh, yeah, next one should be coming up soon. Okay.